uh, stay in bed, save lives. <laughs> and our guest today is uh, John Lloyd, who's a ridiculously talented person. I mean, um, uh, when you look at, the, look, look at the things that he's done in his life, it's sort of unbelievable. He started with something called the News Quiz in his 20s on Radio 4. Um, he went on to produce Not Nine O'Clock News, Fitting Image, Blackadder. Um, he, he then had a sort of a, a, a break when he became incredibly rich and successful commercials maker. Um, and, uh, but this money didn't make him happy, did it, John? No. And um, we get, might be hear a little bit about that. And, and uh, after a sort of period of crisis, he emerged with this new idea, QI, which is <clears throat> about 10 years ago. And it's um, <clears throat> a really brilliant, cheerful, uh, didactic, educational project. Um, and John's joining us from his house uh, near Oxford. John, we're going to come to you in a sec. I just wanted very quickly to um, come to Mark Vernon. John, do you want to give a quick wave to everybody? so can see where you are. There he is. And uh, we're going to have a quick chat with Mark Vernon, who's our resident philosopher. Um, now, Mark, last week and the week before, we spoke about the Stoics. Uh, they weren't stiff up a lip, they would go with the flow. The Epicureans, likewise, were not addicted to luxury. In fact, they were fairly frugal. What about the cynics? Um, what do you think of the cynics? And how would they have coped with uh, this kind of plague or crisis? Because I think these plagues and crises did happen in ancient Athens, didn't they? Quite periodically. <laughs> the, um, the, um, the plague of Athens, at so-called, that you know, killed Pericles, wiped out, I don't know, a quarter of the population, was absolutely devastating. Um, I think that, that, I mean, a, quite a good little thing to remember with the cynics is they weren't cynical. Um, they were called the cynics because they lived like dogs. Um, and sun I gaze is the Greek for dog. Um, but they, an interesting thing I was thinking about them was that they invented the diatribe. Um, the idea that you have a kind of rant or, um, you know, kind of um, preach against something or have a go at something. Um, Diogenes the cynic, the founder, he was once um, seen uh, talking to a statue and people said, why are you talking to the statue? And he said, well, I get a better response from the statue than from anyone else. Um, <laughs> but the point of the, the diatribe was to actually kind of chastise yourself, to shake yourself out of your own stupor. So originally diatribes actually was something you kind of wrote against yourself. And, you know, cynics would say, you know, why am I bothered about uh, the clothing that I have? Um, because, you know, surely there's more important things to want in life. Um, it's that kind of dynamic. And I think that, um, you know, they, the good cynic would have been prepared for this because they would have already um, said, you know, look, life is fragile, stuff happens. Um, why did you orientate your life around the assumption that everything was going to continue without interruption? Um, and, and the diatribe becomes, um, in time, it becomes the sermon and then it becomes the rant against other people. But the original sense was really to kind of challenge yourself. Um, and so, you know, that's one thing perhaps to take from them. You think Diogenes would have taken this all seriously when he just, I mean, you know, in Boccaccio uh, during the plague in 1348, and he said some people just went around Florence just treating the whole thing like an enormous joke and they didn't really sort of take any notice of it. Um, there were some people today who were, who were like that. How would Diogenes have reacted? Would he have self-isolated or would he have thought he was being bossed around by the authoritarians? Well, he he self-isolated anyway. He lived in a barrel, didn't he? Yeah, well, they, they love to shock. I mean, you know, the, 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 the cynics remembered not so much by their philosophy, but by their stories, endless stories. I mean, the, the, the most famous one is the encounter between Diogenes and Alexander the Great, when Alexander, who owned everything, came up to Diogenes, who owned nothing, and said, what can I give you? And Diogenes said, step out of the sun, because Alexander was casting a shadow across his barrel. Um, and they were nature optimists, you know. They really thought that if you, if they were, they were actually the more radical Stoics. Whilst the Stoics did say, go with the flow, the Cynics said, no, really go with the flow. Um, and you will have what you need in life, you'll discover, they believed. So they, although they were super tough and there were never that many followers, there was always a kind of prophetic, um, cynic figure in every generation is kind of one remembered for the for the hundreds of years into the Christian period. Um, so they were kind of the prophets. They were the, in a way they were the memento mori characters, a bit like you do get in other cultures. 
um, who kind of seemed to live on the edge, but somehow reminded you of a greater life. Thank you, Mark. Now, John Lloyd, um, I can see you there in, in, your, uh, in your, your home studio. You've got actually terrific lighting. Did someone plan that for you or, or, or is that random? Oh, we can't actually hear you. Let me just have it on, I'll give it on mute you. There. There we go, yeah. I'm here, yeah. No, I have a little man who comes in, Tom. Yes, a little Zoom guy. A little, he lights me, yes. Yes. Um, so you, your little Zoom guy comes in, uh, gets everything set up before your, before your Zooms. No, not really. I'm just looking out the window and that's daylight. Yes, that's all it is. Just... You know about these things because you're a, you're a TV pro, right? Natural light, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what, what's your philosophy? Uh, well, tell me how your lockdown's going. Where are you and who's in your house with you? Uh, I've got my wife, uh, my uh, son, Harry, his girlfriend, and my younger daughter, so five of us. It's really nice. It's a, been a bit fractious from time to time, you know? People, we've all lost our temper once anyway, but we, we're, uh, you know, we're a philosophical family, you know? We, we try to live some of these uh, uh, precepts and principles, and it's been really hard. I think the thing that I, I don't try not to do pride, but if I'm proud of anything, it's that I'm still married to the same person I married 30 years ago, and I, I like all my children. I don't just love them, I like them. And they haven't um, run away from you or anything like that? Well, no, there have been, you know, terrible, terrible moments we've had, yeah. like everybody does. But it's like, um, you know, all, all those things that you read about in books, I really try to do, you know, like, you've got to get up in the morning, be grateful for what you have. And I, I, I really do wake up and I think, my God, I've got another one. I've got another whole day. This is unbelievable. I don't deserve this. I mean, I never thought I'd make 40, you know? Now, you, you haven't always been in such a cheerful mood, John, have you? No. And why, why were you in a not cheerful mood in, in previous incarnations? Well, I, was, I was known as Mr. Grumpy for a long time in television. Um, or Terry Tension was another name. Oh, Terry Tension's in the room. Um, well, I don't know. It's... I suppose you're a perfectionist. Is that why uh, you sort of want to do, do these things well? Okay, well, here's the thing. Um, there's a Freudian concept called um, infantile amnesia. Are you aware of this? It's when you forget you've been a baby? Yeah. As a no, no, you forget so that you are baby-like. My son Harry said this to me years ago when he was, I think, a teenager young teenager, he said, Dad, can you remember what I was like when I was two? And I said, of course, like yesterday. And he goes, why can't I? It's one of the central mysteries of being a human being is why can't you remember be just before you were two or three? And the reason is that um, it's basically to protect psychiatrists' livelihoods because that's where all the damage happens. All the, all the problems, unless you're actually brain damaged, happens before you're two. <laughs> Uh, and, and it is the engine that drives you, whatever it was, all your resentments, your fears, your, in my case, obsessive perfectionism, the you know, uh, fear of failure, those all come from something somebody said to me when I was tiny. And they, that's what hardwires you. That's the machinery that operates what the Chinese would call the monkey mind, the little man in your head that tells you what to do and what to think. So, um, uh, so I spent until, I was a very lazy schoolboy. Uh, I didn't want to be a producer. I wanted to be a performer and a writer. And I uh, got offered a job by a man with a beard from the BBC and I was so poor I had to do something. So I did that and within three months I was hooked, completely obsessively hooked on the job. I found I could, something I could really do. And I did that without a break for 15 years. I worked every weekend, I missed everybody's weddings. Uh, I just was a completely driven and then I met Sarah, we got married, we had a couple of kids. I won these two lifetime awards in the same year, one from Bath and one from the Royal Television Society. And one Christmas Eve, I woke up and I just hit the, I hit the buffers. I, I couldn't see the point of anything in life. I'd sort of had, in, in uh, psychology, it's called um, the successful malcontent. And it, it's what often drives the male midlife crisis, you know. I'd done everything that I set out to do. I won all the prizes, I had money, you know. I, as you say, I made ridiculous amounts of money directing cheese commercials in the 90s. And, uh, you know, I had a nice car and, you know, a cottage in the country. And I was absolutely bereft for years. The first three years were the worst. I sat and I just mainly crying. 
and drinking a great deal of expensive malt whiskey. And then I spent, I thought, okay, so I'm going to dig myself out of this. It's, I can see that I am the problem in some way that I don't understand. I don't understand why this has happened to me. I have got no reason to be unhappy and I'm absolutely furious, resentful, um, angry and uh, very depressed. And so I uh, sort of dug myself out of the pit. It took about 10 years. The first seven were the worst. And I did it by basically learning to think for myself once again and trying to find out about everything really. And, and QI is basically a, it's a kind of um, byproduct of that search. What it was literally the search for the meaning of life. I wanted to know what is the point of being alive? What, what is, is it, is there something other than he who dies of the most toys wins? Is there another, you know, I'd never read any Plato, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I thought philosophy was boring and pointless and too difficult for me. I never any science. I couldn't possibly have told you how an atom was constructed or what was the difference between an atom and a molecule or a planet and the sun. And I bet quite a few people here don't know the difference between a planet and the star, amazingly. Who, who, except for the scientists among us, can explain photosynthesis clearly? Very few people. And, and when it comes to philosophy, you know, and people go on about, you know, uh, oh, I'm an atheist or whatever. Well, have you read the literature? Have you read the Bhagavad Gita? Have you studied the Tao Te Ching? You know, have you, have you read any of the Quran, for example? Have you actually read the Bible? Have, on what evidence do you base this? Well, there's no evidence for God. And you think, well, it depends what you mean by God. We come onto that later maybe, but um, it's like people are going through life with a bag over their head. Um, that's something I discovered in a, some Sufi sage, you know, that people are sleepwalking through life. They're not really here. They're not awake. And the reason they're not awake is because of the little monkey in your head, the little chap who's, I can hear yours all chattering at me. You know, I know your lips aren't moving, but the monkey mind is talking 19 to the dozen. Why is this guy shut up? I thought he was meant to be funny. Oh, let's tune out. You know, this is not as good as the last idler when, when Mark Vernon did all the talking. All those things that your your what they call your internal monologue is saying, and that is actually not you. That's your puppeteer. That is, that's your puppet fear. Puppeteer. Puppeteer. Yeah. It's the little self. It's the little self that controls you and 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 controls all your feelings and makes you unable to operate it optimally. And and the 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 thing you need to try to reach, at least that's what I try to do, is I've got a philosophy of my own called absenteeism. Okay. So say that again, John. My philosophy is called absenteeism. It has only one commandment, and it is get out of the way. <laughs> get out of the way. And that means in everything you do, whether you're a parent or a film director or an editor, you remove yourself from the equation and things will go fine, thanks. It's we get in the way of ourselves. That's what I think. Too serious for you, Tommy? <laughs> now, did this, um, this sort of enlightenment that uh, this was difficult for you to, to find? I mean, you said you took about 10 years and then QI came out of it. Um, hey, I didn't, I never claimed to be enlightened or anything like that. I mean, I'm just struggling through like anyone else. But the point is, I have thought about everything as far as I'm able and in the time I have, literally everything I could possibly find to think about. I've thought and I've thought very hard. Mm. And, and I have looked for evidence and, and I have worked out for myself a philosophy that locks together in a way which means I can uh, forget about it, really. You're just trying to live it, you know. Now, John, when, when do you think, you know, because you, you, you went from being a, let's say, a, a sort of workaholic um, to being a philosopher and you sort of now combine the two. <laughs> how, do you, how do you sort of carve out the thinking time I mean, when does the thinking time happen for you it must have been difficult to make that time driven as you naturally perhaps are um and uh you know you, you might feel that just wandering around the kitchen doing nothing is, is a waste of time but were you sort of disciplined about your thinking time i mean do you sort of um do you go for walks or <sighs> when when i when I, in my crisis i was just in despair you know i was a, i was a wreck but I was a high functioning depressive and I used to go to work and shoot Barclay card ads. 
and I was quite good at that stuff. Um, I went very angry and I got absorbed in the thing. That's one of the things I found that when I was doing something I really loved, I forgot my troubles. You know, one of the ways to stop being depressed is help somebody else. Stop thinking about yourself all the time. So, and these things and gradually as, as I, the more I thought and, and I, it, because I, I was well overpaid for this very uh, testing job and so I had lots of time. I was home a lot. I, I read constantly. Yeah. And as I read, I suddenly realized that many things in the universe that we think are upside down from the way they actually are. You can see it in two, the two most obvious ways are that everyone will understand straight away, which is the sun appears, does it not, to rise in the east and go overhead and go down in the west. And we now know uh, that's exactly the reverse of that. It's going nowhere, the sun, from our perspective. We are revolving towards it. Similarly, you may know that when you look at anything, the light that comes in and hits your retina hits the retina upside down and the brain turns it up the right way up. And you can actually buy a pair of glasses that turn things upside down and the brain takes, I think it's about three days to work out, hang on, I'm wearing a pair of glasses and it flips it round again. And this idea of inversion is something I'm very keen on at the moment. Many problems are solved by inverting it. You know, you say, no, it's the other way around. I remember in the middle of my crisis, I went into the shower in the morning. I was very hungover. I'd been very drunk the night before, very angry, probably bust a few doors down. And I turned on the shower and I could not turn the shower knob. It, I, it was driving me mad. I went to get some uh, a r monkey wrench from the, from the kitchen and I wrenched it and it nearly came the, off. And I suddenly realized, oh no, it goes anti-clockwise. And there was no problem, you know, and that, in that little way. And I was just thinking earlier, you know, we think obedience is a good thing you know, uh, and that Adam and Eve got thrown out of the Garden of Eden for their disobedience. And this is a really core thing. People could take this away and think about it because um, obedience is what causes all the problems in life. You want to be disobedient where you can. Obedience is what causes wars. You know, the reason the Germans kept having world wars is not because they're a warlike people, it's because they're obedient. Hitler was an elected chancellor and everyone said, well, it's the law, you know. And they went along with it. it it's because they're nice guys, not, not because, what, and the British who are disobedient people, which what's make them such great football hooligans, you know, uh, you know, we, we, we beat them in that one. But, and, and the thing is, disobedience is about, you think of all the people who've really achieved something in life. I mean, obviously a lot of criminals, but you know, most creative people wouldn't sit still at school, didn't get it, were bored, you know, ran away to become a rock guitarist or a painter or a novelist. And, and this is, you know, human creativity is in, and you will not be happy ever if you accept what you are told by other people. You'll, you will only start getting there if you learn to think for yourself. Is that really true? Is that actually what I think? Is it when I'm just repeating what I read in the Daily Mail or what I learned at university? And people are stuck in this groove, repeating, endlessly repeating patterns and thinking it's somebody else's fault. It's nobody's fault but yours. It's your life. You fix it. Am I being too robust here, Tom? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it just it's makes me think, um, what about these people who, uh, let's call them conspiracy theorists, you know, we sort of think they're silly. Um, but, they're, 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 you know, I sort of think, well, they're, they're questioning the consensus. Um, there's a consensus right now about... Um, that we should be sort of, you know, following what the government says about coronavirus. And I mean, some people, my mum, for example, find that quite insulting uh, and she would like to be disobedient. But then other people would say, no, you're putting lives at risk. Well, I don't think you should be disobedient for the sake of it. But um, the thing is, it, it basically means assessing everything as, as far as you best know. I mean, your mum probably doesn't know much about coronavirus, so that's probably about the best advice she has. So being disobedient, like, you know, when, when you say to a child, don't run across the road, you'll get run over. And they say, John Lloyd says, be disobedient and boof. <laughs> That's obviously ludicrous. Who's that philosopher, Mark? There was a philosopher who believed taking it so easy that he used to cross the road without looking and his followers had to stop him doing that because he believed he would never be hit. Well, there is the story about Socrates walking along and falling into potholes and stuff like that. I don't know if it's the same. The same story. It sounds a bit. I don't remember the guy's name. <laughs> now, John, um, 
out of all the different things you've done, which was the most fun, which you have enjoyed the most, which you think has sort of caused the most um, joy in the world? I don't know. They're all, um, the, the, one of the things about absenteeism, which I've always done at work, I go to work with no agenda. All I want to do is I want to, at the end of the day or the week or three months, to emerge with something really good. And it, what is annoying about working with me is that I've only got two buttons. One is terrific and the other is not good enough. I don't have a sort of that'll do thing. Mm. So everything I do is extremely hard, whether it's a, I don't know, a, a lager commercial is just as hard as writing a press release or doing an episode of Blackadder. I give 110% to everything I do. And it's very painful for me. I find work extremely difficult, but the, the satisfaction of doing something and because I know it's not me, what I, all I'm doing is I'm kind of channeling, uh, I'm just waiting until it gets to, to the excellent bit. And so I don't take credit. I haven't taken credit for anything I've done for probably 30 years, I think. And I know it's not me. You can't take credit for anything except turning up and working really hard and not giving up and getting back on the horse when you, you get hurt. So uh, there will be, you know, everything I do, you know, I often think there's life is perfectly balanced from the way the planets go around the, the stars and all this. And from a human life, everything is perfectly balanced. But you, you have a choice as to what kind of sign curve you live in. You know, you can have one that goes like this. This is a kind of, you know, lucky postman, you know, happily married, not many, you know, n nothing terribly testing about the job, but nothing, no great highs either. Um, or you can have one like mine, which is insane, you know, incredible lows, amazing highs. So they've all been, all those programs and things. I suppose the most fun one was The Meaning of Liff, if you know that book that I wrote with Douglas Adams. Oh, The Meaning of Liff, ladies and gentlemen, um, which is the, the uh, things that there aren't words for, given the words which are English towns, which John wrote with Douglas Adams. Yeah, you have to sort of explain it. It's they're all, all the words are uh, uh, recycled place names. So, for example, Kettering in Northamptonshire. Kettering is, in fact, the marks left on your bottom and thighs after sitting sunbathing on a wickerwork chair. Yeah. <laughs> or Epping is the fruitless movements of four fingers and eyebrows when failing to attract the attention of a waiter or barman. That's Epping. I was Epping the entire weekend, Tom. <laughs> and how has your Epping been uh, at home? You know, we're hearing that, as you, I'm sure you know, you know, during Tudor lockdown, the playwrights had to stay at home. There were no plays. The, the theatres closed for six months. Um, and then six months later, there was this kind of explosion of new material because the creative people had been sitting around doing nothing and therefore coming up with, you know, new ideas. Last week we had Dominic West and he said, yes, I've been reading all about Karl Marx. I want to put on a play about Karl Marx. Have you had any, oh, you're, clearly you're sort of um, bursting with creative ideas all the time anyway. Have you had any sort of, any fantasy thoughts that have occurred to you over the last few weeks, things you'd like to do, new ideas, new projects? I just want to thank Ian Probert. I'm seeing the notes go by and aren't they classy? These notes are brilliant. <laughs> yeah. It's worth doing, reading something with me. Ian Probert says, Planets, strictly speaking, don't revolve around stars. Anybody knew that? It's actually space-time that's moving. That is so cool. Oh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's Thank that's you, Ian. Yeah, that will be on the next yeah. series of QI. No problem. And then someone else has written, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> fair dues. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, take that. Sorry, what, what, what were you saying? Yeah, so look, during this lockdown, um, Tudor lockdown, you know, Shakespeare wrote plays. Have you had any sort of, you sort of moved forward, forward creatively? You had some good ideas, good thoughts, schemes, fantasies, the things you'd like to do. Um, honestly, Tom, I'm I'm so busy. You know, we're writing a book. Um, I've just got a thousand things to do. And as you know, I don't think this works. Um, if uh, can I write things on here? Yeah, you can. Yeah, hold it up to the screen. Does it read the right way around? Yeah. Okay. So what I'm doing is my most fun thing I've ever done in my life is managing my son's band. Okay, they're called Waiting for Smith. Where's, yeah. where's, the, where's the camera? Does that read? 
Yeah, waiting for Smith, we can see that. Yeah, well, I was going to come on to this is This is John's other job that he's doing, which is um, managing a pop group. Uh, and the pop star is his own son. Uh, could I guess answer this? Someone said, how long did the Tudor lockdown last? Have a look on our website. Ronald Tuck was the expert, not me. Um, and waiting for Smith, uh, Harry's doing these lovely songs at the moment, isn't he? Yeah, he's just brought out a video called Long Life that's getting lots of love on YouTube, which he shot himself and edited himself. He's an extraordinary thing. Now, people sometimes say on things like this quite wrongly, they say, oh, John, you're a genius or a comedy genius. Thing like that. So I'm so not a genius, not even, I'm not even close. I'm just really stubborn. I just won't give up. I am insane. I am honestly mentally deranged in my refusal to give up, no matter how horrible things get. Harry is a genius. He sits down at the piano and these songs come out of his fingers and mouth like from nowhere. And he can teach himself to do anything in 20 minutes, you know. He's the most extraordinary guy. And I'm very privileged to be able to, you know, what I call manage, you know, sort of bumble around. My, uh, my manager name is Bron Ego. Lovely boys, very talented. Did I mention oh, the ride in the curios? Did I mention the curios? Yeah. I just m must bring up the rider question again. <laughs> Bron Ego, remember the name. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, well, look, John, it's a wonderful, wonderful life. Um, can we, can we, uh, don't go away because we're going to go to Q&A in a second um, with all the lovely people in the audience uh, out there or in the room together with us. But we, we just want to go over to Sandy. Hi, Sandy. Are you muted? Are you unmuted? Hi, I'm um, muted. Hello. Hi, everyone. This is Sandy Burnett. And we've been working with Sandy for years. When we used to have a bookshop, uh, Sandy came in and said, um, why don't you do some courses on classical music? And, uh, and we did, and we've been working together for, for, I suppose, about 10 years now, isn't it, Sandy? Yeah, book, great. Uh, uh, classical music guide for the idler and stuff. Um, and this week we're doing an offer on your classical music course. And what do you want to tell us about today? Uh, how, oh. How's the world of classical music going this week? Uh, I think it's quite a good time for classical music because we've got time. Usually I haven't got any time. But uh, this has given me time to listen and think and reflect and get a bit bored. Uh, so classical music needs time and it needs a bit of mental breathing space. But uh, Victoria, I remember coming in and filming this course in a day, one hot August day, I arrived at the bookshop in the morning and I kind of talked about the history of classical music all day and then it was kind of dark by the end of it, maybe not quite dark, but so it's good. But I've got one snippet. I mean, does anybody want to hear some music? Uh, I've got one snippet of uh, the man of the moment, Beethoven, who was born 250 years ago uh, this year. Beethoven, yeah, I've heard of him. Um, and it's interesting, John, I've really enjoyed your thoughts about uh, trying to find the meaning of things and how to be rebellious. And certainly Beethoven did both of those things. So accuse, you know, this might seem a bit kind of mainstream, but this is the beginning of his, hold on, of his fifth symphony. And um, this is a very interesting piece. I'll just give you 30 seconds of it. It goes, ba 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 ba. You probably know it. And it's incredibly interesting from, the, from one point of view, the musical point of view, because that rhythm comes around again and again and again. It's very intense. But to the romantic thinkers, they weren't just listening to the notes, they thought it was symbolized something else. And I'll maybe say a little bit about that later. Yeah. But let me press go. <laughs> And so on. Oops. Um, so I can stop um, stop sharing that now. So that ba 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 comes around a lot, and it's Beethoven was fantastic at drama and excitement, and also compression of uh, musical ideas. But there's another way of looking at that symphony: is that it's actually symbolising our own personal difficulties, and that's what the Romantics in 1808, when it's premiered, immediately seized upon. E. T. Hoffman said it was like radiant beams shooting through the deep night of the region. And the end of this symphony is a blaze of glory and triumph. So you listen to the whole of that symphony, you're moving from darkness and trouble through into light. So in the 19th century, music was something that helped us through out of difficulties. Maybe, John, it would have helped you. Maybe the Fifth Symphony has helped you out of difficulties. Maybe it did, yeah. Um, so it's not just nice to listen to, uh, which was all the previous generation wanted for music. This is music that can solve the problems of the world and unlock the mysteries of the world.
Uh, so uh, music, through the eras, music seems to kind of ebb and flow between a kind of classicism where order and beauty rules and a kind of turmoil where drama comes uh, to the forefront. So over the thousand years that I cover in the course, um, which is all spoken, by the way, but there's a playlist that runs alongside, isn't there, Victoria? So people can, can switch or pause the video and then, and then listen to the, the excerpts and then come back again. Um, it's, it's really placing it in the context of the time and showing what the meaning of music is. John, um, are you there, John? Yeah. Um, do you like classical music? I, I like pretty much all kinds of music, but like Harry does. Um, uh, I don't listen to enough music, actually. I should listen to more, but, um, um, and certainly I'm very fond of Beethoven, definitely. Um, well, what, did you put, what classical stuff did you put? Because you were on Desert Island Discs, weren't you, um, uh, fairly recently? Yes, and I didn't want to be pretentious. I wanted to do music that I could honestly say I'd tap my foot to this, and I wanted to be very upbeat and cheerful, because I was at the time. Yeah, she had the birdie song and things like that. Not the birdie song, or the chicken song. Um, but I, I used to listen to a lot. I like Scarlatti a lot. I like Mozart piano concertos a great deal. I also like some quite weird stuff, like uh, Messiaen. The Taranga Lila symphony is particular. But I wasn't going to say that on Jet Desert Island Discs that you'd be in Sued's Corner directly, wouldn't you? You, 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 you wouldn't be in Sued's Corner here. I mean, you can be more sophisticated in your tastes. You know, if there's something weird you'd like to mention, that's fine. No, but I like, uh, I say, I like, I like Baroque music very much, Telemann and Bach and uh, all those guys. I like plain song, you know, all those, you yeah. know, I really like. And of course, the thing is, once you get in the habit of thinking like a QI person, nothing's boring. I mean, the rule of QI is everything in the universe, without exception, is if is interesting if looked at closely enough for long enough or from the right angle and it's true it's never let me down no that's what's so inspiring about qi you know i mean you can um you can take the interest in how you sack the dishwasher and you know nothing's boring uh and that's that's a lovely sort of insight to have in that you can find anything interesting like john before we go on to questions yeah um i was remembering that i think that we, we've done loads of events together over the years and um a couple of them you told a uh, a story. I don't know if you remember this about a friend of yours who was going for a job interview. Can you can you remember that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Would you like to tell tell us that quickly? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so a guy goes for a job interview, and um, the interviewer looks at his CV for a while. He goes, "Yes, oh dear, mm -hmm. oh dear." Mm -hmm. So so he says, um, "So tell me, what was you say is your worst fault?" Hmm? And the guy goes, um, well, I, I don't know, probably my worst fault is that I'm perhaps a, a little bit too honest. <laughs> and the interview is, I'm a little bit too honest. A bit too honest. Honest, yes. Yes. A bit too, pure, um, and the guy says, yeah, I don't think we can really call honesty a fault, can we? And the guy says, I don't give a fuck what you think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's have a quick round of applause. Can we unmute everyone? And say thanks to John, and then we'll do some. <laughs> there we are. Thank you, John. I've stolen that. You don't <laughs> well, thank you. I'm going to. If, if Sandy can share his screen, I'm going to try and. Okay, I'm going to mute everybody again now. And we'll. Hallelujah. <laughs> Gonna mute everybody again. <laughs> um, unmute Tom. Thanks. Okay. So John, um, could you unmute yourself as well? If that that would be for because I've got a few questions here. We've got a question from Marnie. Marnie Shaw, would you unmute yourself? Are you there, Marnie? Yes, hello. Great. Hi, Marnie. Um, Go John, ahead. John, at the Idler Festival, when you were leaving the stage, you made a remark about reality. And I can't remember it exactly, but it was something about a string of digits or ones and zeros or something like that. I just wondered if you could say something about that and the way that consciousness fits into it. Uh, okay, so... Um... 
it is my view, um, and I just want to share a bit of Socrates from you. It's a great, uh, great line. I, found, I think George Steiner quotes this, which is, Socrates said that there is a difference between right opinion and knowledge is something that I would particularly assert that I know. So you, you can call this my opinion if you like, but this I am as certain of this as I am of anything, which is there isn't really anything here except consciousness. That is what is what the universe is made of and is it all it is everything else is an outcrop of consciousness okay so this is this one man show i did about this so consciousness is eternal benevolent doesn't have any views it doesn't think it just is so anyone who's ever meditated will know this you might get a flash of it when you are conscious and totally awake but you're not thinking and then it all comes back the monkey mind comes back straight away and you go oh no so, and the question is, how does the universe arise from consciousness, which is not made of anything and is nowhere? As Empedocles said, I think he said the universe, those Greeks, they got all right, is so clever. Um, and the axial age, it's called, I think Mark was saying the other day online. So how does consciousness, which is both a point and everything, it's like it doesn't have any dimension because it's not a thing. Okay, it is a no thing, in fact, consciousness. It is the no thing. How do we get from that to this, to trees and raspberries and hamsters and aeroplanes and all that? And it's very simple. And we, we can relate to this metaphor easily now because what happens is the naught splits into two halves, plus one and minus one. And from that, everything else results. Because once you've got numbers, you want to, all you have is noughts and ones, and you can make anything. You know, you can now download a 3D printed elephant from Sarawak to the Isle of Man, no problem. That's how we watch movies. All a movie is, is noughts and ones in long springs. And it's also true that uh, any physicist will tell you this, the universe is what they call a zero energy sum. It is actually, uh, it's just, the universe is literally a very, very long way of expressing zero mathematically. That is what it is. And so, it, how does that have a bearing on this weird idea? How does it have a bearing on things? Well, for a start, when you die, you go back into this consciousness, but consciousness does not, not die. You know, the, there's a thing called the law of conservation of matter in physics which states that matter cannot be either created or destroyed. It can only change shape, state. And if that's true of matter, the same is even more true of consciousness. You know, you, you, you don't die when you go to sleep, but you, you're not conscious of it. So all you, all you lose when you die is your physical self and your, your personality. And in my case, I should be grateful for that. <laughs> Yeah, we we've, got, we've got I mean, so many more questions, John. Um, do carry on about that. Um, we've got a, a quick one from Serena Soames, who says, have you practiced a long time to get your tie to look like that? Uh, well, I didn't knit it myself, Serena. Um, <laughs> no. I just, Did, you know, no, like just everybody tying else. tying it, just tying it, John. Yeah. It is perfect. No, it's just, I just literally put it on because obviously I've been hanging around unshaven in my pants for the last three weeks, like everybody obviously. else. Obviously, yeah. I dressed up for, <laughs> for the eye. <laughs> okay, we've got another question from uh, Paul. I think, Paul, you've already unmuted yourself. Go ahead, Paul. You there, Paul? Okay, can we go over to Phil, Phil Dancer? You've got a, uh, a question about reading, which also uh, Bethany asked as well, so. Okay, hi John. Hey. Uh, I was just wondering, you mentioned the seven difficult years. Um, I don't know if you can recall, but was there anything that you read in the seven difficult years that particularly helped or that stood out for you in terms of helping you get through it? That, that would be such a long list, Bill. You can probably see some of the books I've got behind me. Well, I mean, yeah, is, that's what prompted the question, to be honest. This, yeah. this comes from, as I say, 12 years working in commercials where I was insanely well paid. And the, the one thing I was able to do was buy as many books as I could possibly carry. It, it's a long, 
it's a long question and there are so many things I could recommend. You should probably get, are you in midlife crisis yourself? You, you, you've gone mute. I kind of worked in advertising flat out for 15 years, 80 hours a week. Yeah. Different context, but, and then quit. And it was the best thing I ever did in my life. And the, I, I can point to the person that helped me in terms of what I read, because it was Eric Fromm. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. And when I read The Art of, the Art of Being and then The Fear of Freedom, it just made me realize exactly what you were articulating earlier, that um, I was just being obedient. And uh, it was time to, to not be. So I, I wasn't. And life's been so much better ever since. That's wonderful. So because... I owe Eric a big one. It is, it's taking responsibility, isn't it, for your whole life. And what we all do is somebody else's fault. You know, mm. your wife is insane. Your children are difficult. Your boss is a, is a fascist. You know, <laughs> that, well, do, do something about it. You know, move, leave. Good for you, mate. I mean, the thing is, you know, this is, question goes round and round as to whether we have free will or not. And that strikes me as an act of free will. And I'm, uh, I, m you have my respect, Phil, for that. It's like when my wife gave up smoking, and we had to live with that for about three years, but that I okay. have up utmost respect for someone who can do that. That's free will. That's being a human being and not a puppet. Yeah, and a lot of people thought I'd lost my mind, of course, the people who continue to be obedient. So it was a challenging thing to do, but it changed everything, so. What do you do uh, now? Yeah. Well, I, I, I then consulted for a bit and sort of, you know, in order to just pay the mortgage. But I, I, the thing I immediately did, I went to Berklee School of Music in Boston and then auditioned for Trinity School of Music in, in London. This is as a relatively older student. You know, I was in my late 30s when this all happened. Phil, Phil, I'm going to actually have to pause you because we've got Sorry. 10 more minutes. Right. Because, but Phil, look up your mute. What's the name of your band, um, Phil? Biscay. After Biscay. The, the Bay of Biscay. So look up Biscay as well when you look up um, Waiting for Smith at the end. Um, so, yeah, Phil is one of our retreaters in um, Tuscany, and um, it's great stuff, and he's a brilliant companion as well. Lovely to see you, Phil. Um, sorry to hurry you, though, because uh, we've got a few questions. We've got 10 more minutes. Um, Josephine Adams, you had another retreater. Hi, Josephine. Hi there. Thanks for that, John. That was um, that was a, a really great, uh, honest oh, uh, um, speech. I was curious about whether a breakthrough of the kind that you describe requires a breakdown, or whether it's possible for younger people who don't necessarily have the kind of life experience uh, can can essentially develop that level of self awareness. Well, I certainly, my youngest, who's 24, is training to be a psychotherapist and doing an MA in that, which is a marvellous thing that somebody so young should feel that she does, um, she works as a volunteer for Shout, which is a, um, a suicide or, or, you know, a self-harming. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, and of course, most of the people on her course are like 15 years older than her, but she's sort of imbibed, I think, because we talk a lot of philosophy at home because, because it's what helps us get through. So philosophy for me became not too difficult, to, but literally a way of saving my life, of, of turning around what, all the things that I thought I knew uh, that were actually wrong. And, and you think your daughter... You, you think know, I, I would love to do this and I could, you know, the problem is you only really hear about people wanting to do it when they are in crisis. And as you know, an awful lot of young people, particularly men, you have this awful thing, the quarter life crisis that people get hit with at 27 or something, they can't see the point. Yeah. And of course, their parents are often ashamed or, or the, 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 the kid themselves doesn't want their parents to tell anyone. So they go into their bedroom and get very depressed and then they go out to the pub and nobody even knows. And those people are extremely at risk. I'm doing a project at the moment with them um, with a bunch of guys from the army who've suffered from PTSD and um, because they have the same problem. They won't talk about it because it's not, it's not manly enough, you know? And so they suffer in silence and then they're gone. It's terrible, absolutely terrible. And of course, it's what we should be doing at school. All this thing that I'm wanging on about from five, if I started a school and one day there might be a QI school, I would start 
right at the top. I wouldn't sort of lie to them um, and pretend that, you know, Father Christmas is, you know, was or wasn't there or whatever. You go right in the beginning. So you start with Stoic philosophy, I would go for, because it's like clear and easy to follow and obvious in many ways once you've heard it. And I'd teach them physics. You know, we'd have Ian Probert as a head of physics um, talking about um, space time in a way that people could possibly understand. <laughs> And, um, and of course, everybody should. And we talk about this all the time, especially when there's a crisis. Why don't they tell you this at school? Mm. Why don't they teach you how to read a contract? We don't need to know about quadratic equations unless we're going to be a mathematician. Mm. But we do need to know is why my feelings get so easily hurt all the time. Mm. Or, you know, how do you keep a marriage together? Or, uh, you know, a hundred thousand things like that. And yes, all the thing is, is there really a universe here or not? These things should certainly be aired, you know, because the Big Bang is poop, honestly. The Big Bang is, you know, serious astronomers, astrophysicists. They're just hanging on to this because it's the best we've got. But there are so many holes in it now that nobody yeah. really believes it. And they don't tell us. It's on Wikipedia as if it's the gospel truth. It isn't anymore. Oh. And, and people ought to, because this is the weird thing that every child before they goes to school, go to school, unless their family is really dysfunctional, is essentially cheerful, happy and curious, and unless they're being abused or something. And then they go to school and they're told to sit down and shut up and do what they're told. They're not allowed to play. They're not allowed to ask questions very much, really. Not so much at primary school, but certainly by the time you get to 13, it is definitely all about discipline and silence and not about curiosity and exploration and fun. Crazy. Indeed, thank Indeed. you. Indeed. Um, Mark Price, you had a quick question. You there, Mark? Yeah, it's actually, it's Denise has the question. <laughs> ah, Denise, hi, hi. Hi there, how are you? Um, Joan, I think you've answered perhaps some of the question that I had, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit more. I'm interested to know how your family and your friends supported you through what has obviously been um, a particularly difficult period for you. Clearly, you've got a very supportive family environment around you, but what were the very practical things that those people that matter to you were able to do to, to help you through that? I, particularly my daughters, were persistently kind to me. I've heard, I have a lovely relationship with both my daughters, which is we have absolutely no side. We all love each other very much and we're all baffled. I have no idea why they like me. I know why I like, why I like them. And I, don't, I think I've had, uh, with my elders, I've had literally one crossword in her whole life and we both hated it so much. We swore privately, we only found this out 10 years later, that we would never ever have another argument because it was so painful for us. But no, mainly it wasn't, there wasn't anything and I didn't go and see anybody. I'm, you know, I'm from a naval background. My dad was a captain in the Navy and it was, you know, walk it off, John, get a grip. Oh dear, your mother will deal with it. I'm going to the shed, you know, yes, oh, good to see you. Your name is, are you Katie? No, you're the other one, aren't you? Yes, well, goodbye, uh, lovely, I'm off to my warship again. Lovely guy was my dad, but not, not really a, um, much emotional. Mm -hmm. connection and and I just had to work it out for myself and it was very very slow and painful and you know I, I wish I'd known I wish I'd had the courage to go and see somebody who could have helped me shorten the journey but actually one of the things I do believe in life I think one of the principles is literally nothing is wasted if you can only see it that way because I am so grateful for what happened to me obviously I'm grateful for being alive and I got through it I didn't get sick or didn't kill myself but it's from that it's made me the person I am, that I'm not ashamed to be. And I am not, obviously not enlightened or anything else, but I'm engaged. You know, I'm, I'm, I venture to say I'm happy. I'm certainly content. And do you and, feel and, like you know, I, I have a clear conscience. You know, I have a clear conscience. I, I, you know, I think that's all you can ask for, really. And do you think, have your family members also grown and become more self-aware as as having gone through this process with you? Yes, and it's particularly remarked mm -hmm. upon by people who know us that we, Sarah and I, are different people. We, we have, you know, I mean, it's been, I hope she's not listening in, but I mean, <laughs> the first 15 years was hell on wheels. It was, a, you know, we were famous for the shouting Lloyds. We were late for everything. We ruined everybody's <laughs> weddings. You know, it was awful. 
and the children had to you know be in the slipstream of that but we have we are the right people in the uh, another thing i believe is you don't get married to the person you want you get married to the person you need if you're lucky you get the person whose chemistry locks into yours in such a way that the terrible personalities and the issues we have to get round and the problems to solve do largely get solved. And that's, that's an incredible, you know, that's a fantastic gift to, to have. But nothing good happens without difficulty. If it's not difficult, it's not going to be any good. So when things happen to you that are bad, you should view them as a gift because they are a sign, probably like Phil, he's in the wrong job and he had the courage and the insight to get up and leave, and he's a happier man for it. Super, thank you, thank you for that. Thank you. John, that's great. We've had another question from Bethany. I'm not gonna bring her in, because we've only got a, a minute. It might follow on a bit from what Phil said. Where, where can we, um, where, what books would, she, where would she look to read, to get some of the wisdom that you have? Um, would you uh, or can you a, write us a list that when I'd you hate jot to say down it with wisdom but um it's not it, it's much simpler than that it's sort of fairly obvious i think but if you um if you remind me um i'll i'll make a list of books like the ones i gave to to my younger daughter for her. oh it'd be so amazing and we'll send it to this list that'd be amazing john thanks so much thank you very very much john um tom do you want to say something you want to ask another question do we have time for two minutes from Mark? Where's Tom gone? He's gone off and drunk his beer. Okay, so Victoria, so, I yeah. have got, sadly, I've got to You've go and go. waiting for Smith on Radio Oxford right now. Do, Fantastic. Do okay, we'll get into do, Radio do have Oxford. Do a listen, everyone. He's really, really good. It's very foot. So I'm going to unmute everybody and... Um, if I can, and let's have a big, big clap for John. Thank you so much, John. And we're all again. Great stuff. So, night, night, everybody. Um, I'm going to, we'll say good night to John. John will say goodbye. Mark, are you still here? Did Tom get a chance to say anything? No, Tom's vanished. I think he's gone to drink his beer. Oh, there you are. Tom, you're going to say the last few words. Can we get a couple? You've got to mute everybody, please. Okay. You've got to mute. Here we go. John. Um, Tom, you've, you've, you've run yeah. off to go and get another beer. No, my, my beer's run out. It's empty. Oh, that's disastrous. Yeah, I know. I just wondered, I know we go over time, but we didn't. Is, is Mark, Mark, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here, yeah. Yeah, well, um, yeah. I just wondered if we could have a couple more words from you, and I know you, because we've missed out a bit. Um, no, you, conclude, we went over time. Let me just conclude with John before we go to Mark. Um, but John's fantastic, and if any of you sort of missed what he's done, um, he was the man who made Blackadder and uh, QI and Not My Clock News, um, and he's a, a brilliant person. It was lovely to, to hear his... Um, his wisdom and, and philosophy. So Mark, and so thanks to him for coming, and thanks to you all for coming, but let, let's just wind up with Mark. What, what, did, what reflections do you have on what John said, you know, from your philosophical perspective? Well, um, John, he really, it's really true when he says that he knows a lot. It's not just because he does QI, but I, when I first met him for you guys, actually, um, I, I'm very interested in a philosopher called Owen Barfield that Victoria actually just mentioned um, very briefly at the beginning, who was uh, deeply influential on people like C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien. He was a romantic. Um, and I thought, you know, this is something I can tell John Lloyd about. But of course, he read him already. He knew about him already. Um, so he really has done the search. He really has yeah. done the quest. And what about his... Uh, can we just close with a few words about... Um uh 
death and Socrates, you know, because I mean, what one thing that John brought up, which is a lovely thought, is that this idea that, um, you know, consciousness doesn't disappear after you die. Isn't that more or less what Socrates said in Phaedo? Well, yeah, they, so the, the normal way of putting it now is that you're either a materialist, which means you, you think the matter is the basic stuff, or you're an idealist, which means you think that consciousness is the basic stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, you, if you're materialist, you think that consciousness is a byproduct of matter. You know, somehow the atoms in the brain come together in complex enough ways to sort of generate consciousness. Or you think it's the other way around. Um, you know, a bit like we can sort of build things with our imagination. Um, so, too, the whole universe is like a kind of cosmic outpouring of the consciousness, the imagination of the cosmos. Um, so it sounds like he's gone more towards the um, idealism side of things. Um, but, you know, much like he was saying that the Big Bang is now passe amongst physicists, um, so too quite what the relationship between physics and consciousness is, um, is still hugely debated, very, very moot. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, but it sounded yeah. to me like he was veering towards the idealism side of things, which I agree with myself, which we, we, it was standard, you know, that was the standard um, until the modern world, until the modern period. Well. Um... Mark, thanks so much for coming along again. Um, and Sandy, would you like to give us any concluding comments? Um, anything we should go, go and listen to now? Uh, and, you know, sort of Lloydian piece of music, perhaps. Uh, did you, did anybody see, uh, see Stephen Fry at the start of the lockdown saying, you know, you've got all this time, just take time enjoying doing things you didn't have time to do before. I think just listen to the music that you love already and just let it, um, let yourself explore it in a new way. Because often, I mean, speaking personally, I'm in too much of a rush all the time. So uh, music demands concentration and uh, you've got to open up your mind. So, uh, so that's what I would say. Okay, thanks, Sandy. Open up your mind, everybody. Get real, get pissed. No, I, sorry, I <laughs> in, in the content of your own mind and go and meditate and all that sort of thing. Uh, and obviously improve yourselves with uh, us and with other people. Um, I think we're going to conclude that. I've got read some, just close with a piece of really, really good news, which is I'm not playing the ukulele tonight. Yay. <laughs> um, I, left it, I left it behind. So that's, uh, I do like to talk to you all with it. Um, and thank you for, for being tortured. But this week you will not be tortured. So um, everybody, well, I'll unmute you for some chaos and then um, unmute you for a nice big clap and say goodbye now but i will leave you all open so you can keep chatting to your friends um if you'd like to stay but uh big uh large hooray and goodbye to all of you thanks so much for coming so lovely to see your faces just brilliant and the babies bye doris thank you bye next week pauline so great to see you all Oh, well. I'm improving every week, Victoria. Hey. Good. Lovely. I think that's a joke. I thought someone was showing me their bottom because of the knuckles. Brazil? Oh, look. <laughs> oh, listen, Dirk, looking glamorous. How do you manage it? Fine, fine, Victoria. Trying harder than me. I'll try next week. Very quiet. Very cool. That's it. See you next week. See you next week. Bye. Bye, Bye Jill. Bye, Jill. Bye. Got to do something to be on it, and I don't know what it is. I'm not pushing it on. I think you mean someone else. The pipe down the pipe.
Bye from Cornwall. Bye. Bye. Bye, Sarah. Bye. 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 Bye.